So apparently it makes a huge difference um, in helping more people find the podcast. You can also follow us on Facebook or on Twitter, Rave Curious. And yeah, so here we go. First, a uh, quick conversation with Michael Tolberg, followed by a longer conversation with Eric Murillo on the Rave Curious podcast. Thanks for listening. I love how all girls are move them body. And when you move your body, you to move it nice and sweet and sexy. Alright? Come on, you How you doing? You know? Like back in the old premiere days. Premiere. Yeah, American premiere years ago. That's what was how that? I was actually that's actually how I was really supporting myself during the rave days. I was writing comedy for National Comedy Radio Network, which was owned by oh. Premiere. And I would in addition to writing, I would do voices from time to time with some really awesome. Can, voice can we hear stuff. a voice? Do you uh, do you want to do this interview <clears throat> in one of your voices? <laughs> So this no, is we're here with uh, people would be very confused to hear like Beavis and Butthead talking about raves. I think I think that could be I could be exactly what people want right now. Uh, we're here with uh, photographer Michael Tolberg. Uh, he has a new book out, um, which I think is I think it's the first of its kind. If I'm if I'm not mistaken, tell us tell us a little bit about. Uh, that is correct, the Josh. The book is called Dance Floor Thunderstorm, Land of the Free, Home of the Rave. And it is the very first book of its kind here in the United States. It's the first full-sized coffee table photo book that really chronicles the rise and the glory years of the rave scene in North America in the 1990s and 2000s, and particularly here in Southern California, since this area was pretty much the center of uh, raving culture during that time period. There's material in there from other cities and other places, you know, as well. But in those days, uh, L.A. really was uh, the place to be, especially considering the different uh, venues that we had available that other places didn't have, as in partying in the desert, partying on a mountain, partying on the beach, you know, partying. You know, we weren't just restricted to warehouses, you know, and certain kinds of clubs and the like. So Right. And and, and these are this, this book is this is all your photos. Yes. That's yeah. that's really the focus of the book. It, it's, it's a photo book. Um, although it does have quite a bit of writing. It does. Um, it is primarily photos. And uh, the uh, back in those days, in the 90s and 2000s, I was writing and photographing for all the major dance music magazines uh, in this country. You know, Herb, BPM, Mixer, Insider, etc. And some abroad uh, as well. Um, occasionally my stuff would end up like in Mix Mag or Q and stuff. And um, yeah, so I in- amassed an enormous library of images, like somewhere in the area of about 100,000. Wow. I mean, I literally have bookcases full of slides and negatives, wonderful relics of the analog era. Mm-hmm. And um, But there is also quite a bit of prose in there, some of my own writing. There are some new DJ interviews uh, that I put in there with uh, DJs like Christopher Lawrence and Mark Lewis and Sandra Collins. I mean, I just wanted to make the book as uh, complete as possible without trying to write a like a rave encyclopedia or something like that's that. That's all. Well, that's that's really the challenge. And and you know, full disclosure for for the listeners, I edited the book. No, um, on the on the you know on, on more on the 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 text end. I, I kind of let <laughs> you know you and you and our, our designer Revis Graphics kind of yep. handle the handle the images for the most part. Yes. Um, but yeah, but that was that was one of the challenges we faced was you know what do you cover, what don't you cover, what is you know what is too what is a rabbit hole, what rabbit hole do you go down, what rabbit hole yeah and do you not go down. And uh, when we would go back and forth in our editing sessions, there were there were some times that you know I was a bit surprised of what you left in and what you cut out, you know, and all that. I mean, but. But, you know, as the editor, I mean, I did very purposely leave that in your hands. I mean, I didn't I chose very purposely not to interfere as much as I possibly and could. And I, I, I appreciate that. Um, mm-hmm. I think it probably also helped that I was living in Berlin. You were in L.A. So <laughs> the, the time zones that we were dealing with. If, if oh, it was, believe I was, me, getting up at 530 in the morning. So we could have our the, conference uh, call. That, there was no advantages to doing <laughs> but, that. <laughs> but I think, you know, and I, and I came I came at it from a slightly different perspective because I actually wasn't in L.A. Mm-hmm. during this time. That's right. You, know, you I, came I from moved, a different part of the country. Uh, yeah, right. I, I moved to L.A. from Detroit in 2000. Three, so mm-hmm. which is basically when this book ends. This book basically covers ninety ninety six through o two. Right. And this is what I refer to in the book as the second wave of the rave scene. Because if you look at the history of this scene, you'll see that it has not gone up smoothly, uninterruptedly, like a, a nice clean line graph or something like that. Yeah, it is far, come far from it. Yeah, <laughs> very far from it. It has come and gone in waves, and uh, the first wave being roughly nineteen eighty eight through. 
uh, 94, which is, you know, when the seeds of this whole thing basically were being sown and they had the first very few early successes and stuff. And then the second wave, at, which is the time period of the book, which is roughly 96 through 02, and that's when everything exploded pretty much mm -hmm. for everybody, not just here in L.A., but, you know, all over the country. I mean, this is when, you know, the budgets began flowing into rave production companies. They could afford reliably, you know, the overseas talent, people like Oakenfold and Cox, you know, mm -hmm. and Fatboy Slim and people like that. And uh, the, this is also when the uh, size of the parties began, you know, going out of the underground stage and very much into the above ground stage, yeah. shall we say. You know, and if you, in the beginning of, an, of this era, if you had a party of 3,000 to 5,000, you were considering doing very well. By the end of this era, I mean, you had Electric Daisy Carnival and Nocturnal Wonderland drawing 40,000 a night, which now today sounds quaint. Yeah, but at, <laughs> but at the time, that was... Time, it was unbelievable. And, and remember that this was all in a time of total underground do-it-yourself mentality. They had no major corporate support, no major mm -hmm. radio campaigns, no major record label support, no major anything. It was all done from the grassroots level. And that was part of what made the thing such a wonderful experience, to be part of that as it expanded almost exponentially mm -hmm. year after year after year. I mean, we knew at the time here in Southern California that we were at the very center of something very, very special. I mean, it was obvious. Yeah. <laughs> there was no denying it whatsoever, you know. Well, so. I, I remember because, you know, when, when you first when you first hit me up and asked me to be a part of this project, you know, my first thought was obviously, ah, I'm probably not the guy. I wasn't even there. But, you know, we, we, we talked a little more. And then, I, you know, I, you gave me access to your Dropbox. I started looking at some of the photos. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because from my perspective, like some of those photos, I remembered seeing those <laughs> probably probably in Herb. Um, it was it's right, entirely possible. You know, right when it started arriving in Detroit, I think like 96, 97 was mm -hmm. when Herb went from a regional publication to a national publication. Right. This is also right when you started, you know, photographing. 97, 98. Right when this, when you know, kind yeah. of second wave happened. Mm -hmm. So this, this, all these things kind of came together. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I remember reading Herb. I remember this kind of portal into the LA scene, even though it covered... Everything. Oh yeah, it and it was global. The... It was truly global, and that and that's another great do-it-yourself triumph mm -hmm. for Raymond Roker to be able to build that enormous network. And it, and it was it was hard back then. There was no, there was no internet like no. now nowadays. Everything is, and it's not to say one's better or worse, but nowadays everyone has access to everything all the time. Exactly. Everybody, it's easy to know what every party's like People... in Berlin and Tokyo and right. Australia and L.A. and Detroit. And everywhere back then, it was just you know you got these these tiny little little things. It wasn't even moving images. It wasn't YouTube. It was literally photos mm -hmm. and words trying from a to party convey that, from a party that was actually months ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, from a, a party that was three four months ago. Right. And and it, and it was really interesting. I definitely remember you know, we had this thing in Detroit where because the the whole like kind of candy raver thing mm -hmm. very much grew out of L A. Right, and that was that was very much a West Coast thing. And, We're and not going to find much of that in New York. Well, no, that's not entirely true because with the club kids thing in New York, there was a certain amount of candy right. stuff going on there. But you're right, and especially in the Midwest, you know, Chicago, Detroit. Yeah, we had we had that. fat we had fat pants and and baggy polo shirts. Right, and that was you know fresh jive, and that was kind of the extent of it. Jenkos until yeah. your photos started <laughs> you know started arriving you know in issues of herb mm -hmm. and you know maybe bpm like a, a little virus. bit later <laughs> with all these candy kids and you literally you saw the shift where you know suddenly the next generation of kids by like 98 99 in mm -hmm. detroit oh yeah were suddenly mimicking the la you know the la look because mm -hmm. people will you know inevitably do what they see in the media right um so. well and la has always been a, the center of pop culture anyway of course you know course. R rave or not you yes know? so you know there's so there's that aspect no it's not well. limited it's not limited to to electronic music in the rave scene that's no. a, a natural effect but it, but, but it does have that that uh you know advantage of being like oh Hollywood, you know, so, or something like that, you know. Perhaps, yeah, yeah. yeah. So people, or, or, like, or, in a lot of our cases, it was oh, Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> we had those moments too. Believe me, I mean, it's, uh, but uh, I mean, there were definite uh, advantages to being in the middle of that whole thing. Absolutely, because I mean, I mean, not only did we have all the wonderful venues and stuff here in LA, but we had all the talent that was either coming through here on a regular basis or was moving here. 
you know, people like, you know, Paul Oakenfold and Dave Ralph, you know, and uh, DJ Raps, Andre Collins, Christopher Lawrence. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on. But, you know, it was uh, it was so fantastic to be able to go from a tiny little not even a warehouse party, just a little place with 50 people in it where, like, you know, Doc Martin, you know, maybe mm-hmm. be somewhere in downtown L.A., you know. And then the next day you could do Nocturnal Wonderland at the Orange Show with, you know, 30,000 people, you know. I mean, it was – and everything in between. And, uh, and, and I want to ask you one last thing. Why, why do you think it was – why do you think now was the time – to put this book out because you know it's well partly because of the success of edm there's now an audience in the mainstream that is a bit more open to the stories of what was going on in the rave scene certainly more than there were in the mainstream back then right i mean you remember well how the mainstream media did their utmost to belittle and ostracize you know the rave scene in any number of ways whether it was in the news or whether it was in sitcoms you know or whatever i had my foot in many different social scenes over the years and i have yet to find a scene that was more really unjustly singled out like the rave scene was you know i felt that there had to be a voice in you know coming from another direction but what what about now does does this feel like vindication does it feel like yeah, we won, or, or does it? Well, kind of... the, the the fact that EDM, as distasteful as some of it may be, you know, the fact that it has been so overwhelmingly successful. I mean, that's our the sweetest revenge, mm-hmm. you know, of the rave scene. I mean, without the rave scene, there's no EDM. The fact that we made this possible, and the fact that we're finally beginning to be recognized for that, long mm-hmm. overdue. The fact that this is finally being aired out in the public, I mean, yeah, that's uh, there's a certain amount of, of vindication. To nice, that, nice. Know. So, so you know, again, the the, the book is great, and mm-hmm. and I don't just say that because it has my name in the credits. <laughs> it's, it's it's a really nice book. It's where can people get it? Okay, the, mainly if you want to get it online, uh, you can go to the book's website, which is dancefloorthunderstorm.com. The book is not yet on Amazon. We're working on that. And uh, it's also available in a number of uh, book and music stores in and around the Los Angeles area, including uh, Book Soup and Skylight Books and the great Dr. Free Clouds down in Fountain Valley run by our old friend, Mr. Ron D. Cor. Nice. nice. And, uh, Did yeah. I also see this, it's at um, Amoeba as well? Did it I is. See? It's at Amoeba Music, yes. And uh, there's a possibility that uh, we might be able to get it up in an Amoeba San Fran as well, which would be very nice. That would, that would be great. Yeah. And um, Dance Floor Thunderstorm, though, is the the com is the uh, main place to go. All right, awesome. Well, Mike, thanks for thanks for coming by, and you know, my pleasure. More importantly, th- you know, thanks thanks for making me a part of this project, <laughs> and you know, thanks for taking all these all these great photos and Absolutely. sending us on that trip back. It, it was it was a fantastic journey, both the original journey and the journey making the book as hard and as arduous as it was. <laughs> cool. So people can on. go online; they can check out a sample of the photos, mm-hmm. and when they like what they see, they'll exactly they'll order the book exactly. So. Awesome. Right. Thanks a lot, Michael. Yeah, pleasure.